Welcome to Grow Money Business, the podcast dedicated to helping business owners grow both their wealth and business on their own terms. Here's your host, Grant Bledsoe. Hello, everybody. Grant Bledsoe here. Welcome back to Grow Money Business. This week on the podcast, my guest is Stephen Short. Stephen is an expert in family succession planning, and I'm guessing that you might be somewhat familiar with the stats about the portion of second generation businesses that fail versus succeed. When you have a business that's passed on to a younger generation within the family, the failure rate goes up by quite a bit. And then if you look at the failure versus success rate of third and fourth generations and beyond, it continues to go way, way down. Stephen focuses on successful succession planning for family-owned businesses. And we had a wonderful conversation about the framework you need to keep in mind if you're going to navigate this successfully. He shares his own story and own challenges with this in his own family and is in the process of writing a book about the whole thing. So we had a great conversation and I hope you enjoy it too. Hey, everybody. Real quick before we jump into today's episode, I have been advised by my attorneys to remind you all that none of what you might hear in today or any other episode of Grow Money Business is financial, investing, tax, legal, fitness, or even relationship advice. It's content that you're free to use and deploy on your own terms. And before you take any actions on what we might cover in the show, I really encourage you to consult with your accountant, attorney, or financial planner. If you don't have a financial planner and think that you might need one, be sure to check out threeoakswealth.com to learn more about my firm's planning, advice, and investment services. Stephen Short, welcome to the podcast, my friend. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me, Grant. I appreciate you coming on the show. You are in a different time zone. What, what time is it where you're at right now? Uh, so I'm in Dublin in Ireland, or as it's commonly known, the center of the known universe. Uh, so it's 5 p.m. here, so uh, it's uh, it, it's getting a bit dark uh, and it's getting a bit cold. Well, it's not getting a bit cold. It's been a bit cold for a while because it's Dublin. Uh, but it's uh, 5 p.m. here this evening. And you? Where are you? I'm in Sacramento, and I'm just getting my day started. It is 9 a.m. where I sit right now. So I'm a little farther away from a beer than you are, unfortunately. But uh, <laughs> Well, we I can, mean, we you're not, navigate. but you should... You, you should be, but yes, you don't have to be. But that's that's, that's, that's true. Choice. That's true. <laughs> it is only Monday here, so yeah. th- this is a show about <clears throat> aligning your personal finances with what's going on in small business ownership. There, there's a whole lot of stuff there, and ways that you can organize the business, run the business, uh, in a, in a way that really. Um, is collaborative with your personal finances, your personal life, your family, your values. And you focus on an area that's particularly interesting to me and to a whole lot of closely held businesses around the world, and that's succession planning with other family members. So can, why don't we start with, could you tell us a little bit about your work and and um, and, and what you do at this point in your career? Uh, yeah, so I have, I've spent my entire adult life, most of my childhood in family businesses. I've grown up in two different family businesses. Uh, And the reason that this really, this whole topic became so important to me was about about 11 years ago now, my wife was pregnant with our second daughter. My first daughter was two and a half years old. Uh, And I remember coming home, having spent uh, probably a couple of weeks, nearly a month or two, just arguing on a day, almost daily basis with my folks on the direction we needed to be taking, the project, like the courses we needed to be running, what we needed to be doing with the business, what types of people we needed to be looking for, where we needed to cut things, where we needed to build things. And I was just drained. I was emotionally, mentally, physically, everything, just exhausted. Uh, and I slumped down at the kitchen table when I got home. And I said to my wife, and I said out loud for the first time, ever, I need to leave the family business. Otherwise, my parents will never see their grandkids again, because we will hate each other. And we won't be able to be in the same room together. And as soon as I said that, as soon as I verbalized that thought, every fiber in my body reacted. And viscerally, I knew that was the last thing I wanted. So I did not want to go down this path. 
I can't be the first person in the history of the world that has had problems in a family business. I have to go and I have to go talk to people. And I have to go research it. And then I started to build and try things with my folks and do different things. Uh, and we ended up uh, and I ended up developing the, the five P's of succession planning, whether you're in a family business or not in a family business and how it needs to work to be successful. Uh, but I can tell you now, fast forwarding, uh, we have my wife and I have sold our house. We have our kids that we've two door, two girls. Uh, we've sold our house uh, and we are renovating my parents house and we are all going to be living together. Uh, as a multi-generational household as well as a multi-generational business uh, now we've a couple of tricks in that as well we've two kitchens two living rooms two kind of living areas but we're all interconnected but the thought of that happening when we couldn't stand being in the same room as each other at the beginning of this process um it's it, it is possible and even if you're clashing and have different personality types and different views and different ways of looking at things with your siblings with your parents it's possible to get through it. And um, I think it's fundamentally important because family businesses, even 20 years ago, or maybe 40 years ago, family business wasn't a term. It was just a business because most of the time it was family members that were in it. So um, it's, it's about 70% of the world economy is made up by family businesses and small to medium family businesses at that. So I think it's really important to, to spend a bit of time to get that right. Uh, absolutely, and, and this is something that I mean, we, we we've all heard of the, the the crazy statistics of how many second generation businesses fail versus succeed, and then that just falls off a cliff for third mm -hmm. and uh, generations and beyond. W where do you start if, if you're in this situation? You you um, are working in a business with uh, older or younger generations within your family. You, you have all this conflict that has. Uh, the potential to grow into animosity and resentment, where do you start? So the first thing really is to figure out from everybody and to get everybody aligned on what's the purpose of the business? What are we here to do? Like, what is, what is the wrong in the world that we're writing? Because every business, product, service, website, whatever it is, they're doing something that is writing a problem for their customer. That's what it is. So what is it that we're ultimately trying to do? Is that something that's sustainable? Has that changed? When we started the business 20 years ago, does that problem still exist? Or can we is do we need to change how we interact with that problem in order to solve it for the future? Um, innovation, technology, new ways of doing things, all of these things really impact on, on any business. If you look at, a, let's say, a generation. So a, a generation is anywhere between 20 and 30 years. If you look at the global, the, the Fortune 500 list, the top 20 companies from 2000, and you look at the top 20 companies from, 2000, from 2020, I think there are only seven of the same companies that are in that top 20. So in the shortest span of a generation definition of 20 years, an immense amount changes globally. So obviously it's going to impact on each one of our small to medium family businesses. We need to be able to see what's coming down the line. and sometimes unfortunately the current generation just don't they're not living in that world they haven't grown up in that world to to feel what's happening next sounds very similar to prudent business planning that any business owner should go through anyway yeah i, I mean for me the overlap of when the current generation and the next generation fully swap should be a maximum of five years. If it goes on for longer than that, it just get tends to, to stagnate. Five years, between three and five years is kind of that sweet spot. So when you start this process, the current generation should really have a five to six year vision of the company. But the current, the next generation, the people who are stepping in should have a much longer vision for the company, should have 20, 30, like the BHAG, the big, hairy, audacious goal. Um, but it still has to be aligned for the first couple of years. And there still has to be uh, both sides on board. Right, right. And and so if, if there are issues with that kind of alignment, if if the two sides are totally misaligned, is there any recovering at that point? What what, what can you do to bridge the gap? Or is, I mean, is that a good signal to <laughs> consider something else? I mean, not necessarily. I mean, look, it's, uh, it, it's obviously a, a consultant answer to get a consultant in to have a chat about it. But... <laughs> um, 
sometimes having that external um, set of eyes and have that external voice in the room, because sometimes there's baggage or there's other bits. I mean, family businesses, how often is the boardroom table and the kitchen table the same piece of furniture? So there is all of this overlap and it's not just a, a standard business decision or a cutthroat. OK, here we do this and we cut. Jenny's not working anymore, so we fire Jenny. Well, Jenny's my sister. We're not firing Jenny. So um, having that, having somebody else come in to really do uh, a day's planning or a couple of sessions of planning and get everybody aligned and then make the decision. And there might be a case of, look, this is actually where the business needs to go. This is where the majority of people are. But there's a couple of people who are maybe the old stalwarts or the new generation that just want to completely um, disintegrate everything and start again. Maybe not everybody is aligned, but if enough people are aligned and the right people are aligned, then let's go forward and then figure out what we can do with the family members who are not aligned and how we can make them whole as well. Sure, sure. Okay. So, wh- so where do you take it next then? You, you, you uh, figure out alignment on either side of the table. You're talking no more than a five or six year window for the older generation. Obviously, the younger people ha- taking current, over current, have to have a current generation, not current older generation. generation. Hey, excuse generation. me. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for correcting me there. Uh, the the new generation, let's call them. Uh, obviously, mm-hmm. the vision must be for a, a much longer time period. Where do you go from there? Yeah. Well, so there's three mindsets that I think are, are really, really important for any kind of succession planning, but fundamentally for for family planning. Uh, so the first one is if we if we take any kind of hero story that has been written, has been shown on movies or TVs, all of these hero stories and these hero journeys, they follow the same process. They go from the status quo where the world is the same. And then the hero, the person who we're following, goes into the special world where all of these things happen. But right before they go into the special world, they need to have a, a mentor, a sage, or a gubbin, or a, a something. If we think of like Dumbledore for Harry Potter, or Yoda for Luke Skywalker, or I, I, I don't know many other examples that aren't nerdy examples like that. But if you think of any kind of hero's journey, there is always a mentor or some kind of sage to give advice to the hero before they go off onto their journey. But the end of the hero's journey is actually to come back to the normal world, to to return as a better human being. And I would argue that us as entrepreneurs, we are all on our hero's journey. Male, female, doesn't matter. Um, it's all about being in that special world and then coming back. So the first and most important mindset that current generation entrepreneurs need to have is they need to go from being the hero of their own journey to the mentor of the next generation's journey. They need to come back full circle and then be able to help the next generation to go through that special world, to come through the entrepreneurial journey and the entrepreneurial life that we're all, that we all face and we all work through. Um, So it's a fundamentally important mind shift. And a lot of current generation, when we have a misalignment of where the current generation is, they still feel that they're the hero on their journey and they don't want somebody else to to cut the legs from under them. They find it difficult to go to the mentor role. And that's where we get tension, where the the current generation isn't ready to, to relinquish control. Now, the reason that it's so important for the current generation to go from hero to mentor is because the mind, the second mindset is what got you here is not going to get them there. So everything we talked about this uh, a minute ago there about uh, how in the space of 20 years, there's such a dramatic shift in the fortune 500. This is the same for every business. What worked 10, 15, 20 years ago is not necessarily going to work for the next five, 10, 20 years. There has to be changes. There has to be, uh, ad- uh, adaptations. How many of us 20 years ago, how many of our parents when they started the business had a Facebook page? None of them because it didn't exist. So, and how big was that for, and now, okay, now it's TikTok and Instagram and all the rest of it, but it's all of these things move and evolve. What got my parents to where they got to is not going to get me to where I need to go to. And where if my kids ever want to join the family business, what got me to wherever I'm going to end up is not going to get them to their future. So it's all a cycle of making sure that we understand, go from the hero of our own story to the mentor of the next generation story, because what got us here is not going to get them there. And I think that's really, really important. 
Yeah, that's that's. Uh, th- I really like the way that you frame that in the in the analogy with the hero's arc, and 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 that's you know what got us here. It, what got us here is not what's going to get us there. Is a cliche. You're not going to get th- them there. Yeah. Not going to get them there. Excuse me. Is is a cliche that's tossed around a fair amount. I want to say, but really, really very important. Mm-hmm. If it's okay, I want to jump back to your personal story and ask how mm-hmm. this phase went for you. When, when you're growing up, was there an expectation that you're always just going to work in the family business, regardless of what your own career intentions were? How, how did this play out in your no, life? No, um, there was. It was always the option. So there was always the option of if you want to join the family business, it's there, but it's not going to be handed to you. You've got to earn it. So you've got to come in and and do your part. You've got to earn your stripes, and you've got to do the the shitty jobs that nobody wants to do because. Uh, you're not you can't come into the company as the marketing VP just because you have an Instagram account like it, it you, you've got to be able to work your way up. Uh, my sister, for example, is not interested in the business. She's not involved in the business at all. Um, she is she's on a totally different path from she doesn't want to be an entrepreneur. She doesn't like the lifestyle um, and she's very happy and she's doing what she's doing. And she's still involved in major decisions because it's a family business, but she's not involved in anything else. Um. But for me, like there was never, it was never mandated that I had to join the family business. But from an early age, it was pretty clear that this is what I wanted to do. I I saw aspects of the business that I really enjoyed, that I liked the idea of, I liked the thrill of. There were aspects of the business that I thought were, geez, God awful, terrible idea. Why would anyone want to do that? Okay, that's what you pay other people to do. Um, uh, So it was... I, plus, one of the, the best uh, definitions of an entrepreneur that I've ever heard is somebody who is uh, not very good at managing other people and also totally unmanageable themselves. So they have to put processes in place to be able to work with teams and grow with people and, and be able to network and, and do all the bits and pieces that they, they need to do. So, um, so it was never a given uh, that I was going to join the family business, but it was something early on that I knew I wanted to do. And funny enough, that point is actually brings me to the third mindset uh, of uh, that needs to be driven home. And that's this idea of internal and external development for the next generation. Uh, if you've got uh, a next generation that wants to join the family business, they've got to come in as low as possible. To, to show that they're earning their stripes, they're earning their way up the ladder. They're not just coming in and going, oh, well, I've done two years in college now, so I'm a VP of whatever. It's no, you got to come in at the, if you were not family and how you'd earn your way up, there would probably be a lot of extra coaching and a lot of mentoring because they're family members. So they'll get probably a little bit more of a leg up, but they've still got to earn their stripes. Yeah. If, if you're looking for an easy way to alienate the rest of the employees, that's, that's probably... The, the best and fastest way to do it, right? <laughs> and the other thing that I, I've found in, in and this is a, almost a universal truth, that family businesses, even the people who are not family members involved in those family businesses are very often treated like family. So there are people who have worked, and when, when we sold our business, when we sold one of the businesses there a couple of years ago, there were some members of the team who have been with us for between 12 and 20 years. Um, so there's a, a lot of feeling of you, you got to keep the staff, you got to keep the team uh, respected. You got to respect them. You got to look after them. And they're part of this idea of uh, stewardship. Yeah. Yeah. That, that That's an excellent point. Um, now, so, so, so at this point, we've got alignment number one. We have to make sure that the timelines that's in everybody's head kind of line up. Mm -hmm. We have to have this uh, concept in place of the exiting generation. I forgot the word you used, but I'm trying not to use the word. Current generation. Current Current generation. generation. Thank you. (laughs) Current generation has to step into the role of mentor to Mm -hmm. allow the hero's journey to uh, really begin for the new generation. And then where do we take it from there? So first of all, we need to figure out. So the the first bit is the pick, the the purpose. What are we what are we looking to do? What is the business looking to do? Then the next bit is pick who's the right person. So there are a couple of scenarios. There's one where there's an heir apparent who 
whether they like it or not. And you asked me that. So you've obviously experienced this in the past, right? You're the eldest son. You're now going to join the family business and take over. That's not always a, a recipe for success. And I would argue statistically, uh, more often than not, it's a recipe for disaster. Um, so who is the pick? Who's the person that we're going to have as the leader of the organization for the next, whether that's 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, whatever it is, who is going to take over? You could also have a, a scenario where you have more than one person who is interested in taking over or more than one person who sees it as their job to take over. Then we need to figure out, right, well, what's the purpose? Where are we going? Who's the best person to get us there? And who's the best person to get us there? It might be it might be Paul for the first five years and it might be Jenny for the next 10 years because of their personality strengths and what we're actually hoping to accomplish. It's not necessarily, okay, right, Grant, you are now the CEO. Off you go. I'm off to my boat in the Bahamas somewhere. Um, and it's all on you. There's, a, there's a, a sense of, well, actually, maybe you're the right person to grow it from... I know three to 7 million or whatever. And then Jenny, who is more process orientated and her personality is more detail orientated and she's a great COO. Maybe it's time for her to step in at that point and keep things steady. We think of uh, Tim Cook in Apple, for example, who uh, not the visionary, but was able to, to completely scale that business. Right, right. That sounds like a very challenging ledge to walk because on the one hand, if, if, if you're an owner and you've got more than one kid, maybe none of them want to be involved in the family business at all, in which case that's yep. a pretty simple solution. You don't have to worry about any of the extra mm -hmm. you know, family relationship angles. But on the other hand, if you have more than one person interested, I mean, how do you navigate that? You, you have you have Paul, you have Jenny, uh, maybe they're, they're, they're both qualified at different stages of the company and that's the best plan for the business but what if one of them is just totally unqualified that, that, that that's, that's just a um, a situation that is rife with potential mm -hmm. disaster within the family I, I mean, uh, and again we we've got to come back a step back and we've got to come back to the purpose like what is it that we're trying to do and then the pick who is mm -hmm. actually the best person to get us there and we need to i mean people can be um i <laughs> I don't want to say delusional, but they can be uh, a little bit uh, over reliant on what they believe are their abilities. So you can say delusional. You can say delusional. Okay, delusional. That's fine. <laughs> I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say it if I was sitting with a client. But um, <laughs> um, but sometimes it is a case of going. Well, look. What are your strengths? Let's do some. Uh, we do some personality workshops. We do some strategy workshops. We do some ideation. We do some like really clear the room, get as much. And all we're interested in are people's strengths. We're not knocking people down. We're going, where is the best, what's the best role for you to be ultra successful? What's the best role for you to be ultra successful? Because ultimately, once the two of you are successful, the company is successful. So it doesn't necessarily mean that the CEO is the, the head honcho and she makes all the decisions and everyone must bow down uh, in reverence or anything like that. But it's figuring out who has, who wants it, who has the best uh, uh, personality or the best set of aptitudes or abilities to be able to get us to ultimate, where we actually want to go because two different companies that do the same thing have two different goals. So who's the best person for that? I have a friend who has a manufacturing company, uh, three kids. I am actually friends with the kids, not the father. Um, so the three kids all work in the company. The eldest son did not want to be the entrepreneur. So he's a line manager and he looks after a lot of the operational stuff and looks after the day-to-day -day running of the factory side of things, the manufacturing side of things. The second then is the daughter. She need, she didn't want to have the headaches of this either. So she looks after the books. Again, very detailed, orientated person, uh, very good at order, doesn't want to be um, making the, the, the ultimate decisions. So it's the youngest son who's grown up gone, Actually, I want to be that. I want to be the leader of this. So it's the youngest son who's being groomed to take over as the CEO with his older sister and his older brother working side by side. And obviously in the hierarchical organization, like he will be the younger brother will be the boss. But uh, that's that's another conversation for how you manage that at, at Christmas dinners. Right, right. But it sounds like both the other siblings are completely on board with that based on yeah. all the... And, and if there is ever... Uh an argument for bringing in someone objective 
uh, who has professional experience in you know whatever field it is you're you're trying to solve for, this is a wonderful one because all of our uh, you know, internal family relationships are colored by family dynamics and, you know, past experience and all this. And having somebody objective come in to help ass- assess strengths using personality assessments and all these other tools is just a far more accurate way to go through that exercise than everybody's individual subjective opinion about their siblings and their kids and their parents mm-hmm. and, and all of the above. I, I, I would guess because that in, their in- impressions are a lot different than what you would uh, see after a, a, a workshop. Absolutely. Because you'll, you'll have people that will be bringing up, oh, you pulled my hair or you, you kicked right. my toy or something when we were six <laughs> or something like that. So it uh, has no bearing. Well, it might actually have bearing, but usually it doesn't have bearing on the business. It goes alongside the delusional thing, right? That That's when it has yeah. bearing. <laughs> okay. So, so now d- and I know I'm jumping around back in in between your personal yeah, story and, and the framework here. Do you have siblings yourself? How, how did this go in, in your So yeah, situation? I, have, I have one sister who's not interested in the business. She doesn't want to, she works um, in uh, kind of social care circles. So she works with uh, inner city kids in, in Dublin here, um, has no interest in, in being involved in the business, um, but is happy to be on the board for right. major, major decisions. But doesn't want to rock anything just wants to make sure that we're doing things right by the community which is which is perfect gotcha yeah and you had mentioned your sister sorry my head had no, forgotten fine. so she's on the board of the business or do you have uh like a um like a family committee or something like that no she's on the board of the business there we we haven't so we haven't gone down that road uh i think we're probably not big enough as a family that we would need to have a family board because there's only myself and my sister there's no cousins or, or anything like that involved, but I've seen these work successfully where there is a board and then there is a family board and the family board might have two seats on the board. So the family board make a decision and that impacts, but there's still other people who are um, non-executive directors who help to to shape the business. And then the, some of the profits are funneled back into the family trust. And so the family is able to gain benefit from the success of the business, even if they're not involved day to day, they're not getting a salary, but they get uh, part of the profits. Yeah. Yep. And, and, and in larger families, that is a wonderful structure to help manage all this. And and the purpose of the family board, usually you don't want the business owner being the chairman of the family board because you need some separation of duties, but the family board is there to, you know, talk about, I don't know, annual travel and charity and, and, you know, the family's vision, the family's purpose, the family's intention in a distinctly separate entity and structure from what the business has going on. Do you have a sense of how big the family needs to be for that to be relevant? Um, I don't, uh, I mean, I've seen it. I, I guess it also depends on whether the family are actively involved in the business or if the family, if your kind of third generation where you have a number of cousins that are just not interested in the business or that they're not actively drawing a salary from it. They're just part of it. Then you need to have this differentiation. If you're second generation and it's your parents and you and your sister are working together or something like that, you probably don't need it because you're on the board anyway. Um, Your family members are involved in making those decisions. It's when you have family members that are not day to day in the business, that's when you'd need something separate, I suspect. Sure, sure. That that makes sense. So at this point, going kind of chronologically, and you mentioned five P's here at the beginning of our yeah. discussion. Um, I assume that this framework that we're talking about here are, are related to those five P's. Yeah, that, yeah. So we've the got fair? the two. So this pur- purpose is the first one. Pick is the second one. Uh, the third one then is actually the longest part of it, and that's prepare. So that's that's where we get the kind of three to five year window. That's where we want to look at spending as much time as we can helping to make sure that the next generation understands the decisions that have been made in the past, understands the history, but ultimately is able to make the right decision for the future of the organization. So um, it's preparing them, it's coaching them, it's mentoring them. Ideally, they'll also in in this time or before this time will have gotten this external stuff as well, where they might have gone and worked in another company or they might have or at the very least gone and got some education somewhere on relevant stuff, whether that's business, finance, marketing, whatever is their interest. Um, 
and but that prepare part is is five years really max right and 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 probably what that entails differs a whole lot depending on the experience of the incumbent and the family dynamics and and all of the above no yeah but i mean it it, it really is where the men the hero to mentor bit shines through uh, of making sure that i'm helping you i am here to help you to be successful in your journey um and this is uh you're going to make decisions you're going to make mistakes you are but i can i have to make sure that i prepared you as much as i possibly can because if i have to lean back in to fix something everything is going to go to hell in a handbag because i won't have all of the nuanced information i won't be there to make in the run up to that decision so whatever i say is going to be wrong somehow so i need to prepare you to make sure that you're able to do it right right okay so purpose pick prepare what do we and have then it's next promote promote so there's two meanings in this promote. The first is obviously to give the next generation the job to actually publicly, right? You're now the COO or you're the CEO or the marketer, whatever it is, the position that you're preparing them for. Um, so that's the first part is to actually give them the job. But the second and the most important part is for you to be their cheerleader, to promote their good work around the organization and to make sure that they are seen as the leader of the organization. It's really common for people, especially if you founded the business you've been working there for 30 years that if a, an employee or a supplier or somebody didn't get exactly what they wanted out of the next generation they'll come to the current generation to consult not to get advice or to get them to go <laughs> against their kid but just to consult on this idea <laughs> you as the current generation as part of the promoting you've got to be a brick wall no nope. I absolutely 100% that is Junior's decision. No, and it's I agree with Junior's decision on this, and I think it's the right decision. And I'm sure they'll they'll be. He might follow up with you to explain it a little bit more publicly. You have to be the biggest champion for the next generation. Privately, you can have as many disagreements as you want. All of those, like you might think, here this is going wrong, or this person actually needs this. It's a continuation of the prepare, but that has to happen behind closed doors publicly everybody has got to see that you have 100% faith in the next generation. So that's the promote bit. Hence the long window for the prepare phase. Exactly. Yeah. To have as much as possible. And then the final P, the fifth P is patience, because let's be honest, it's going to hit the fan every now and again, both sides are going to say something or do something, or there's going to be a, a, an inability to just let go or an inability to just do what they needs to be done. It's patience. There has to be patience and there has to be time for uh, the current generation, the next generation to to actually spend time as a family, as well as spending time as workmates and to have let off that steam, um, go to football games, go on hiking trips or go whatever out of the office away from your normal environment and actually spend time as, in my case, uh, father and son, mother and son or whatever. Uh, So it's uh, that patience bit is also really, really important on both sides. Absolutely. So back, so back to your story, you, you, you told us the beginning of it where you were concerned that if things continued on their current path between you and your, your folks, that your folks would no longer have a relationship with their grandkids. How'd you write mm-hmm. the, how'd you write the ship? What, what happened from there? Well, I mean, it's, I, I'm not going to tell you that then I made that decision and the next day I clicked my fingers and everything was great. I mean, it did, it took time of, of having these conversations and going to rugby matches and going out for dinners and going out for dinners, partly sometimes with the express thing of, we're not talking about work. We're not talking about any of the projects. We're just here. My wife is here. My kids are here. You're here. We're just here as a family. F- forget work. We can have that tomorrow morning in the office. That's fine. That took a little bit of restraint on both sides and invariably a couple of conversations would creep in, but uh, nothing too major. Uh, but it also required me and my folks going for either one-to-one dinners or lunches or a coffee outside. Not my office, not their office, not the family home, not anywhere related. It was, look, let's just go across to this coffee shop and, and have a chat. And start to to really lay it on the line of the purpose of the business and where I see it going and where so my uh, father is quite similar to me quite um, 
entrepreneurial out there kind of larger than life wanting to talk to people wanting to meet people but also quite process orientated my mother is much more process orientated data facts and research so i had to be able to understand both of their personalities to be able to understand how i needed to explain my thinking to them in a way that would resonate with them as opposed to just me going this and them just buying into it so um (laughs) So understanding those personality types and how that needed to be communicated, uh, that took time. And the, the, that took time for me to then become the marketing manager, marketing director, getting on, to, taking over as CEO, ultimately buying my parents out and buying their shares. Then uh, a couple of years later, convincing them that the best interest of everybody was to sell that business. And we ended up selling that business. And that was another six month conversation of where is the industry going? Where is it going? I've done everything that I want to do with it, with the business that I can do with it. This is where it needs to grow. And I'm not the right person to grow that. So we need to make sure that the team is looked after and all the rest of it. Um, did you, did you come to that uh, on your own? Did you have advice or influence in, you know, just taking some time back, going out to coffee, going out to dinner in a different environment, not talking about business? And then, you know, once the fringes of the relationship started improving a little bit, focus on what's the purpose of the company. How, how, did, how did, you, did you know to do that intuitively? So that, I, I, really, when I started figuring out the bit about the purpose and the purpose being the most important thing that to, to focus how we're positioning the family business, and that purpose can be what right we're wronging in the world or what wrong we're writing in the world. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's a really bad mix up there. Um, um, but it, it can also be, look, what what are we adding to the world? Or as a family, what are we doing? Is this, is this a lifestyle business? Is it a business that we're just we're running to support our lifestyle so as we can homeschool our kids or so as we can travel or so as we can do whatever. And that's a perfectly legitimate purpose of a business. The next generation might be will, might be interested in going, yeah, I want to continue that. I want to have that lifestyle for me. Or they might want to grow it or they might want to change it or they might want to pivot or they might want to do something else. Um, I mean, all of the top companies in the world that have been around for more than 50 years, they started doing something else than what they're doing today, uh, largely. Um, either if not a completely different industry, they definitely did things differently. So um, having that uh, vision of what we're, we're aiming to do was really important. Now, the pick was, in, in our case, the pick was kind of done because I wanted to take over. My sister didn't. And then it was a figuring out where, where do my strengths lend themselves? What can we grow? And that was my vision then to be able to, to prepare things. Uh, sure. And then the prepare was just, uh, and the prepare is, is ongoing. It, it doesn't just after five years stops. It's just after five years, it's not of, like officially in the business because the current generation has stepped away. Right, right. So let me see if I can remember the five Ps. Purpose, mm-hmm. uh, pick, prepare, promote, and patience. Uh, you got it. Have you, have you written a book? I'm writing a book. Um, called build a killer family business without killing your family. Ah, um, excellent. So it's it, <laughs> that all of that's going to be in there with some some case studies and and like there'll be a lot on what to do with the different picks and the different personality types and things like that. Right, right. Okay, ec- excellent. I look forward to reading it myself. So you're you're in Dublin. I sit here in Sacramento. Most of the clients that I work with are kind of up and down the West coast of of the U S not, not all of them, but uh, the majority, I would guess that these dynamics and these issues that we're talking about in our discussion today are somewhat ubiquitous, no matter where on earth you're dealing with. Yeah. So um, I'm working with um, some people in Vancouver at the moment. It's, it's been all virtual, obviously with, with travel restrictions. Uh, I'm traveling out to the Middle East in early next year to to do some some events and to do some some coaching and things like that. Um, so these truths. So this is what I say to people as well. There's, there's a lot of uh, very successful people who can teach you and show you and actually do the the selling of your business or can do the the tax and the 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 affairs, the stuff that you do on a day to day basis. I wouldn't have a clue how to do even in Ireland, let alone internationally. 
I don't look at any of that stuff. All I'm looking at is the interpersonal relationships and how people are, are interacting with each other. And people are largely the same around the world. That, that, is, that is an interesting uh, perspective. What, what, is, what is the name of your consulting work and, and what is the size of business that um, is a good fit for what you do in case any of our les- listeners need help in this area? Uh, so, I mean, I'm, I'm at uh, SuccessfulSuccession.com uh, or KillerFamilyBusiness.com for, for the keynote and the book. Um, but really, it's businesses that are, I'd say, between a million and, and plus. I mean, I've, I've worked with people who are m- much higher up in, in bigger organizations because the problems are the same. It's just the scale of how many people they have to look after is, is different. But current generation to next generation is the same under a million. It just tends to be a little bit scrappier and a little bit, um, then they want to figure it out themselves as as much as anything else. And that's partly why I'm writing the book as well is to go, look, here's all the information. If you want to do it yourself, do it yourself. If you want to have a chat with me, I'd love to have a chat with you. Um, but, um, it's, it is possible. It is possible to not have your boardroom and your kitchen table be a battle zone. <laughs> uh, and that's what I want to help people get to. Well, you, you are, you're doing great work, my friend. Um, I, again, I, I appreciate you coming on and, and sharing your, your story and your framework. What have, what have we missed? What should we leave listeners with? Uh, really, it, it comes back to the purpose and getting people aligned on the purpose of why, why are we here as a family? Why are we here as a business? Once those two are aligned, everything else can slot into place because it makes it clearer who's the pick, who's the right pick, um, how do we get the people who are not picked set up for success, uh, and it also fi- allows us to, to figure out how to get how to build the business in a way that we need to build it. Well said. Well said. Well, thank, thank you again, Stephen. This has been great. Uh, I appreciate your time. And um, I want to be respectful of it, of course. So why don't we call it there? We covered a lot of ground. My pleasure. Thanks a million. Thanks for tuning in to Grow Money Business, the podcast dedicated to helping business owners grow both their wealth and business on their own terms. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you digest podcasts to ensure you don't miss out on future episodes and announcements. And feel free to submit questions to growmoneybusiness.com.